The Michigan murders started on a hot July afternoon in southeast Michigan in 1967. It was a time of freedom and a place of freedom near the campus of Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti, Michigan. 19-year-old Mary Teresa Flasier, a student at EMU, decided to take a walk. It was a warm summer evening in July. Mary bid farewell to her roommate and strolled off down the street. 28 days later, Mary's heavily decomposed and mutilated body would be discovered near an abandoned farmhouse in Superior Township, just north of Ypsilanti. Mary would mark the beginning of a two-year killing spree that would leave more than six young women savagely murdered, their families' lives forever altered, and a town with a black shadow that would not lift for many years if it ever did at all. Welcome to Bitter Endings, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, J.R. Erickson. In Bitter Endings, I'll bring you stories of those taken too soon, the silent many who no longer have a voice through which to seek justice. The Bitter Endings podcast is sponsored by my fiction novels, the Northern Michigan Asylum series, are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an Audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. Just a quick warning before you begin today's show. There are graphic details in some of the murders of the co-ed killings in the Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor area. Listener discretion is advised. Mary Teresa Flasier, called Chi-Chi by her family, was born on a snowy December day in 1946 to Robert and Teresa Flasier in Ypsilanti, Michigan. She lived on a large farm with her mother, father, three sisters, and three brothers, seven children in all, who were deeply connected to their religion. Also residing on the property were Mary's grandparents, aunts and uncles, and cousins. She had a close-knit family who loved and supported one another. As the firstborn daughter, Mary had an especially deep bond with her father, who treated her like his princess. Mary was a talented young woman who taught herself to play the acoustic guitar, piano, bass drum, and the organ. She was active in her church choir and played in the high school band. She loved to sing, paint, sew, and knit. In 1967, Mary was a sophomore at Eastern Michigan University studying French and accounting. She dreamed of one day being a French language interpreter. Mary was a petite girl. She stood just five feet, two inches tall and weighed only 104 pounds. She had short, dark hair, green eyes, and wore rimless, dark glasses. July 10th, 1967 was a sunny, hot Sunday in Michigan. 19-year-old Mary Flasier woke up in the apartment she shared with her roommate near Eastern Michigan University. She showered and went to Mass before grabbing a cup of coffee and heading to the university for her job working in field services at McKenney Hall. In the afternoon, Mary drove to Silver Lake, hoping to meet her sister and friends there. However, the parking lot was full and a trooper waved her by. Mary continued down the road another five miles to Half Moon Lake, where she spent the early evening walking around and even playing an impromptu concert for a group of children that appeared while she was strumming her guitar on a bench. Eventually, the children wandered off, and Mary returned home to her apartment in Ypsilanti, which I'll sometimes refer to as Ipsy. At 20 past 8, Mary told her roommate Nancy and Nancy's boyfriend that she was going to go out for a walk to get some fresh air. Mary never returned. The following day, a Monday, Mary's sister received a concerned call from Nancy. Mary hadn't come home the night before, nor did she show up for work. The sister phoned their mother, who immediately drove to Mary's apartment. 
Teresa Flasier saw Mary's car, a 63 Comet, and a beloved gift from her father parked in the parking lot. Inside Mary's apartment, nothing appeared amiss. Even her purse had been left behind. Teresa questioned Mary's roommate about what she'd been wearing the day before. Her roommate said she'd left in an orange tent dress covered in white polka dots, wearing a pair of straw and leather sandals. When Mary's parents, Robert and Teresa, went to the Ypsilanti Police Department to report their daughter missing that afternoon, the police were not overly concerned. Ipsy was, after all, a college town, and the girl had not even been missing for 24 hours. However, another night passed without any sign of Mary, and then another. Later, Mary's father would admit that he knew Mary was dead the very first night she didn't return, in that strange way that so many parents seem to sense when tragedy has befallen one of their children, both Robert and Teresa understood that Mary was never coming home. As days turned into weeks, the Flasier family began to pray only that Mary's body would be found and that her final moments had been without great pain. Police put out the missing persons advisory for Mary on July 12, 1967, two days after she'd last been seen. Detective Vern Howard of the Ypsilanti PD began interviewing Mary's friends and family. As he mapped out Mary's final hours on that Sunday, July 10th, he discovered that Nancy, Mary's roommate, was not the last person to have seen her alive. Several people had witnessed Mary walking near her apartment that Sunday evening. One witness was an EMU campus policeman who'd once helped Mary jumpstart her car. Another witness, a man who lived nearby and was sitting on his porch, saw Mary walking back toward her apartment. He told police that he witnessed a young man in a blue-gray car pull alongside Mary. She appeared to shake her head no, as if she'd been offered a ride and declined. The car pulled away, only to circle back around and cut Mary off as she walked by pulling into a driveway. Again, she appeared to tell the driver no. The last time the witness observed her, Mary was crossing the street in the direction of her apartment and the car had squealed away. The detective could find no trace of her after that final sighting. For nearly a month, the search for Mary Flasier continued with no new leads. However, on Monday, August 7, 1967, nearly a month after Mary vanished, that all changed. Two teenage boys, one 15 and the other 16 years old, were tinkering with an old tractor on a farm in Superior Township, just north of Ypsilanti, near the intersection of LaForge and Gettys Roads. Another farm was close by, abandoned and weed-choked. It had become a lover's lane of sorts. The boys heard a car and crept toward the old farmhouse, thinking they might get a glimpse of a couple seeking some privacy. As they approached the dilapidated farm, they heard a car start up and pull away. They didn't see the vehicle, but they followed tire tracks that went into the high brush. As they walked the path, they were overwhelmed by a terrible smell. Moments later, the boys saw the source of the odor. A black mass lay in the field. The hot and humid summer days had accelerated decomposition and flies swarmed the body. The boys, suspecting it was not simply an animal, but unsure due to the state of the body, rushed to the Ypsilanti State Police Office to report the finding. Once on the scene, detectives immediately knew they were looking at a human body. This was soon confirmed by Assistant Washtenaw County Medical Examiner, Dr. Henry J. Scoville, who identified the body as a woman's. Mary Flasier had been found. Due to the condition of her corpse, there were no distinguishing features and she wore no clothing. However, puncture wounds in the torso revealed the girl had been stabbed. Her feet were missing, as was one of her hands. The body also appeared to have been moved several times based on drag marks and other grassy areas of discoloration on the ground. 
Ipsy police detective Vern Howard, who'd been working Mary's missing persons case, went to the farm as soon as he heard of the discovery of a body. A gut feeling told him it might be Mary. As police searched the area, one found a woman's sandal near the driveway. It looked relatively new and had a straw weave, which Howard knew matched the description of the sandals Mary was last seen wearing. For three hours, troopers searched the property. Then an officer lifted a large section of corrugated paneling. He discovered a pile of woman's clothes. On the top was an orange dress with white polka dots. The dress had been ripped down the front. Torn white panties and a torn white bra lay with the dress. Based on evidence at the scene, detectives believed Mary had been killed elsewhere and her body was dumped at the remote farm. Mary was identified through her dental records. Dr. Robert M. Hendricks and Dr. B. Naylor, both Washtenaw County pathologists, completed the autopsy. Mary had suffered 30 stab wounds in her chest and abdomen. Her feet had been severed at the ankles and one of her hands was missing. Sexual assault could not be determined due to the condition of Mary's body. Mary's body was taken to the Moore Funeral Home in Ypsilanti. While the body was being prepared for burial, a strange thing occurred and was later reported to the police. An employee at the funeral home said that a young man walked in and asked to take a photograph of Mary's body. He claimed to be a friend of the family's. The man was told that would be impossible, and he soon left, driving a blue-gray car. The employee found it odd that the man was not carrying a camera. Mary's parents were informed of the incident, and they said they knew no one who matched the description, though it made both them and the police uneasy. On Saturday, August 12th, Mass was said for Mary at the Immaculate Conception Roman Catholic Church in Milan, Michigan. Police attended the funeral on the chance that the killer would make an appearance and reveal himself through odd behavior. Although detectives would continue investigating Mary's murder, there were few leads and little came to light in the following months. A year would go by before Mary's case came to the forefront of detectives' minds. It was not a lead that would bring it back into focus, but another murdered co-ed. On June 30, 1968, another Eastern Michigan University student, Joan Elspeth Schell, vanished. Joan was a 20-year-old art major at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti. She was the youngest of four daughters, born to Sylvia and James Schell on December 1, 1947. Joan had a small-town upbringing with parents and sisters she was close to. She was intelligent, but also a dreamer. Joan stood five feet five inches tall and was rather thin, weighing less than 100 pounds. She had long, dark hair that fell nearly to her waist and hazel eyes. Joan spent the last weekend in June 1968 with her parents at their family home in Plymouth, Michigan, which is located about 17 miles northeast of Ypsilanti. On Sunday, June 30th, around 9.15 p.m., Joan's parents dropped her off in Ypsilanti at the apartment she shared with Susan Colby, another EMU student. Susan had also spent the weekend at home with her family, but she'd already returned to Ypsilanti when Joan arrived. Joan spoke on the phone to her boyfriend, Dale Schultz. Dale was AWOL from the Army for the third time and hiding out at a friend's place in Ann Arbor. She made plans to take the late bus that night to meet him in Ann Arbor. The last bus was scheduled to leave at 10.30 p.m., so Joan quickly threw some of her things in a large red burlap bag and hurried out the door. Her roommate, Susan, accompanied her on the walk to the bus stop. They stood at the bus stop and waited, but when 10.45 came and went and still no bus, Joan decided to hitchhike to Ann Arbor. Susan tried to talk her out of it, but Joan was determined to get to Dale. At 11.25, a car that had passed them earlier that evening pulled to a stop near the girls in front of McKinney Hall. 
The car was a two-tone Pontiac with a red body and a black top. There were three boys in the car, and one stepped out. He looked like a student, tall, clean-cut, with dark hair, and rather handsome. He wore a green EMU t-shirt. He asked the girls if they needed a ride. Joan said she did and hurried over to the Pontiac. She called out to Susan that she'd call her when, when she reached Ann Arbor. Susan returned to her apartment feeling rather depressed, though she didn't quite know why. Joan didn't call. At 12.35 a.m., Dale called Susan to say Joan had never arrived. And this was odd because Ann Arbor was a short drive. It shouldn't have taken much more than 15 minutes to get to the apartment in Ann Arbor from Ypsilanti. Dale couldn't call the police because he was AWOL from the Army, and he asked Susan to call instead. Susan called the Ypsilanti police to report that Joan had gotten in a car with three unknown men more than two hours before, but had not yet arrived at her destination, which was only a 20-minute drive away. The policeman who took the call was not overly concerned. He told Susan to wait until morning. Her roommate would likely arrive by then. If she hadn't, he said, give them a call back. Fairly early the next morning, Susan called the police for a second time. Joan had never arrived in Ann Arbor. She was terrified that something had happened to her friend. Two officers took Susan's statement, and Detective Howard, the man who'd worked Mary Flasier's case the year before, immediately got an uneasy feeling as soon as he saw the missing person's bulletin. Joan lived and hitched a ride just blocks away from where Mary Flasier had lived. That Monday afternoon, when Susan still hadn't heard from Joan, she called Joan's dad, James, at the department store where he worked. Susan did not want to call Joan's family home because her mother, Sylvia, suffered from a heart condition and the stress might be too much for her. James Shell was concerned for his daughter. However, his first thoughts drifted to Dale Schultz, Joan's boyfriend. Dale had been in trouble with the police before, which was how he ended up in the Army to begin with, and he'd already gone AWOL multiple times. James assumed that Joan was with Dale, not knowing that she'd been heading to meet Dale and never arrived. And this not knowing was mostly due to Joan's friends trying to cover up the fact that she was meeting Dale so as not to get Dale in trouble. When police learned that Joan's boyfriend was a deserter, they immediately started searching for him, including releasing a newspaper appeal that he make contact with the police regarding Joan Shell. Dale soon called Joan's dad and told him that he didn't know where Joan was and he was very concerned about her. This scared James because he'd assumed that his daughter was hiding out with her boyfriend. Now it was clear that something else had happened to Joan. James Shell made an emotional father's appeal on Channel 4 News, begging for information about Joan or for Joan herself to come home. However, the filming produced few leads. Detectives began looking into the hours surrounding Joan's disappearance. An elderly black man who'd been waiting at the EMU bus stop that Joan visited on Sunday night reported seeing a dark-haired girl get into a car with a young white man. The girl's friend, a blonde, which we know was Susan, her roommate, walked back down the street alone. Another young woman also witnessed the dark-haired girl who climbed into the red car with the black convertible top. She noticed there were several men in the car, and the girl was carrying a large red bag. The other girl she'd been with, Susan, walked away alone. The witness noticed the car drive behind McKinney Hall traveling east in the opposite direction of Ann Arbor. Two men who worked at McKinney Hall also came forward with stories from Sunday night. One man, a janitor, reported finding three young white men in McKinney Hall at 11.30 p.m. using a payphone. The janitor told them the building was closed and they needed to leave, which they did. 
A second man who worked in McKenney reported seeing the janitor ushering the boys out. A short while later, from a second-story window, he watched a red car with a dark top pull from the parking lot. He assumed it was the same three young men who'd been escorted out minutes earlier. Despite the various sightings of the vehicle and the young men, no one came forward to state that they'd picked up Joan that night. Five days would pass without word on the whereabouts of Joan Shell. The following Friday, a hot and humid July 5th, a crew with the Hannigan Construction Company was installing storm drains in a wooded area near Glacier Way in Ann Arbor, the site for an upcoming subdivision. Two of the construction workers decided to take a water break. As they stood at the road edge, cooling down, one of them noticed a repulsive smell. He commented that it smelled like something dead. As he and the second man picked along the tall grass at the road edge, they were horrified to discover an arm poking from the weeds. When they looked closer, they realized a dead body lay in the grassy ditch. A young woman, her face a black mask of decomposition. She was slashed and streaked with blood. The two men ran down the road to where their foreman, Lynn Bailey, stood. Bailey had briefly worked as a police officer. He returned to the scene with the two men, careful not to disturb potential evidence. He, too, was horrified to see the grotesque state of the woman's body. Her white underpants and a blue dress were wrapped around her neck. She wore a single, round, gold earring. The grass near her body had been trampled, but the foreman saw no blood on the grass. The Ann Arbor police were summoned to the scene, but before they could do a foot search of the area, a downpour sent the men running to their cars, washing away any evidence that might have been left in the tall grass. The autopsy on the body was performed by Dr. Robert Hendricks, who had also assisted in the autopsy of Mary Flasier the previous summer. Dental records and fingerprints confirmed the body was Joan Shells. She'd been stabbed 25 times, including wounds that nearly severed her spinal cord and one that penetrated her skull and brain. She'd also been raped. The state of Joan's body mystified investigators. Her upper torso was badly decomposed, the skin blackened, while her lower body showed very little decomposition. It was clear she'd been murdered elsewhere and kept at another location for several days before being dumped along Glacier Way Road, likely within a day of the body's discovery. Joan's murder sent shockwaves through the public and the various police precincts. Detectives immediately noticed connections between Mary and Joan as victims, as well as their murders, though they didn't publicize these ideas until much later. The method of killing both Mary and Joan were similar. The girls were both students at EMU. Both worked at McKenney Hall, and they lived in close proximity to one another. Both girls had also been dumped in isolated, wooded areas. Dale Schultz, Joan's boyfriend, turned himself into police, not aware that Joan's body had been discovered that very morning. When he was told, he sobbed in the interrogation room. He also agreed to a polygraph test, which he passed. Another lead came into the Ann Arbor police in the days after Joan was found. Two EMU students had spoken to friends about seeing Joan walking with another EMU student they knew on the night she vanished. When police spoke to the students, they both agreed they thought it had been Joan they'd seen. One of the students mentioned the young man that was with Joan looked like a guy he'd been in a fraternity with a guy named John Norman Collins. Another lead also tipped off police about Collins. A supervisor in McKenney Hall notified police that one of the student employees was harassing another co-worker with gruesome details about Shell's murder. The name of the student? John Collins. 
police questioned Collins. The handsome, six-foot, square-jawed student claimed he'd been at his mother's house in Centerline the entire previous weekend, not returning Sunday the 30th until well after midnight. Collins also mentioned that his uncle was a state police corporal who could vouch for him, a man named Daniel Leak. When police talked to Leak, he told them John was a police buff and a good kid. Police saw Collins as an unlikely suspect and moved on in their investigation. According to many of the reports of the Michigan murders, the next victim was Jane Mixer, whose body was found on March 21, 1969. The U of M student I covered in the previous podcast. I won't go into detail on Jane's murder here, because at the time of the crimes, her death did not fit the profile of the other murders, and 30 years after her death, police linked DNA in her case to another man. For more details, on Jane Mixer, check out my previous podcast. Although Jane was murdered by another young man, her murder happened in the Ypsilanti area, and she was a young 23-year-old University of Michigan student. And for those of you familiar with Michigan, Ypsilanti and the University of Michigan are very close. So here is this 23-year-old girl who's being murdered and her body dumped just miles away from where the other young women's bodies have been dumped. To the public, there was little to distinguish Jane from the other victims. It was clear that someone was murdering young women in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. Jane's death heightened fears in the area, which only increased when another body was discovered just four days after Jane's. The missing persons call had come into the Michigan State Police Post in Ypsilanti on March 22nd. Sharon Santucci was supposed to meet her 16-year-old friend Marilyn Skelton at McKinney Student Union on the campus of Eastern Michigan University. Marilyn never arrived. Marilyn's brother and friend dropped her off at a gas station near Arborland, a shopping center in Ann Arbor, and just three and a half miles from McKinney Hall. Marilyn had called Sharon from a payphone asking for a ride, but Sharon's husband was out with their car, and she was unable to pick her up. Marilyn said she'd hitch a ride the three miles into Ypsilanti to EMU. The state police officer told 17-year-old Sharon that Marilyn's family would need to file the report. Over the next couple of days, Marilyn's boyfriend contacted Marilyn's parents as well as police in an attempt to get them to search for the 16-year-old missing girl. However, since she'd previously run away and her parents were not overly concerned, the police were reluctant to get involved. One of the problems with Marilyn's case was that she'd been using drugs and her parents had become accustomed to her deviant behavior. They assumed she had simply taken off. And remember, this is 1969. It's a time when there was a lot of freedom and people were using drugs and people did disappear for days at a time. And she had had a history of doing this. So even though there there was this history of doing this, something that I that I find frustrating about Marilyn's case in particular is that her closest friends and her boyfriend, the people she was most likely to be with, they were concerned enough to call the police, which you think would spurn her parents to feel concerned, but uh, apparently it didn't. Marilyn Skelton was born on March 4, 1953 in Wayne County, Michigan, to parents Helen and Archie Skelton. She had an older brother named Thomas and an older married sister named Barbara. In the year before she disappeared, Marilyn had started getting into trouble in school and with the law as a result of drug use. Unfortunately, these activities led both Marilyn's family and police to not take her disappearance seriously. At the time that Marilyn vanished, she was just five foot four inches tall, quite slender. She weighed around 115 pounds, and she had long, light brown hair. Marilyn's body would be discovered on March 25th. 
A surveyor with the Washtenaw Engineering Company was marking points in an area of heavy wet brush in a subdivision that was being newly constructed. It was a chilly Tuesday in Ann Arbor in a remote area off of Earhart Road out near Glacier Way. And you'll remember Glacier Way because that's where Joan Shell's body was found. As the surveyor walked, he suddenly stumbled over something bulky in the grass. In the wet leaves, he spotted the dead body of a girl. In a panic, he braced from the scene, jumped in his car, and started down the road. After a few moments, he came to his senses and he returned to the job site. The Ann Arbor police were called and detectives arrived a few minutes after 11 a.m. The girl's body was badly beaten and covered in welts. Her head was swollen and oozing. Perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the scene was the 11 and a half inch branch that had been shoved between the girl's legs and into her vagina. The girl's clothes were scattered near her body. Police were shocked and dismayed by the fourth murder in less than two years, and worse, by the horrific scene that clearly told the story of the brutal rape and murder that the girl had been subjected to. Reporters arrived soon after the police, and Ann Arbor Police Chief Walter Krasny held a short press conference in which he stated, quote, this is the worst thing I've seen in 30 years of police work. We can't say this has no connection with the other three murders. There almost has to be some link. The autopsy revealed that Marilyn had died from a devastating blow to her head, which had crushed her right eye socket and damaged her brain. Mud on her shoes revealed she'd likely walked into the area where her body was found. A piece of dark blue cloth was stuffed deep into her throat. Missing from the scene was Marilyn's purse, her wallet, and a diamond engagement ring given to her by her boyfriend, Michael Millage. For a period of time, the police looked at Marilyn's family as potential perpetrators of her murder. It had come out that Archie Skelton, Marilyn's father, was abusive, and Thomas, Marilyn's older brother, was a heavy drinker. However, polygraphs and the similarity of her murders to those of the other young women soon caused police to drop the Skelton men as suspects. The fourth murder created a rising level of panic among the public, fed in part by the media. But the police, too, were seeing the undeniable connection and feeling the pressure to catch the murderer before he struck again. One challenge with the investigations was how many police agencies existed within the crime scenes. There were six total agencies involved, including the Ann Arbor Police Department, the Ips Salani Police Department, the State Police, Washtenaw and Wayne County Sheriff's Departments, and the Eastern Michigan University Campus Police. After the fourth homicide, a universal system of filing on all the cases was created and made available to all of the police agencies. Twenty investigators amongst those agencies were put in charge of working exclusively on the four homicides. 22 days after the discovery of Marilyn Skelton's body, the community would be rocked by another disappearance, this time a girl who was only 13 years old. Dawn Louise Basum lived in the slightly more affluent area of Ypsilanti called University Heights. She was an eighth grader at West Junior High. The Basum family lived on LaForge Road in a two-story home that was less than a quarter mile away from the campus of Eastern Michigan University. Dawn had been born on November 28, 1955 in Ypsilanti to Father Lewis and Mother Cleo Basum. 
Dawn was the youngest of four children, two sisters, and one brother. She loved music and decorated her room in record album covers and guitar decals. She was popular in school, loved to dance, and often had girlfriends over for slumber parties. Dawn's father had died of cancer in 1964, so for the previous five years, her mother had been raising her children on her own. Tuesday, April 15, 1969, was a normal day for Dawn. She attended her middle school classes and in the evening had dinner with her mother and older brother around 6 p.m. Wearing an orange mohair sweater over a white blouse and blue denim stretch pants, as well as black shoes with straps, Dawn went next door to her older sister's house and asked her brother-in-law to drive her to Depot Town. Depot Town was a dilapidated area in Ipsy where many of Dawn's friends hung out. It was located just a couple of miles from Dawn's home. Her brother-in-law dropped her off at Depot Town around 6.20 p.m. She hung out with friends until a little after 7, and then she began her walk home. One friend, a boy named Earl Kidd, walked with her for several blocks until they came to a railroad crossing, about five blocks from Dawn's house. She planned to follow the tracks home, and she walked on alone. Dawn passed two teen boys fishing from a footbridge over Huron River that passed by the railroad. She chatted with them briefly and asked if they'd walk her home. Unfortunately, they both declined. Dawn was sighted again at the railroad tracks just before 7.30 p.m. A man standing on a hill overlooking the westbound tracks noticed her. Francis was his name, and he was a train buff, and every day he clocked the Wolverine, one of the few passenger trains that still went through the area. He saw Dawn hurrying by and last noticed her making her way toward Railroad Street in the direction of LaForge Road. A cook on the Wolverine also glimpsed Dawn as she passed. Dawn would have been less than a half a mile away from home when she vanished, sometime between 7.35 p.m. and 8 o'clock. No one saw her get picked up, nor did anyone who knew her believe she'd accept a ride from a stranger. When Dawn did not return home, Cleo Basum started to worry. Shortly before midnight that Tuesday, she called a sheriff's lieutenant, whose daughter was a good friend of Dawn's. He told her to call Dawn's friends, and if no one knew where she was, to phone the police. At 12.45 a.m. on Wednesday, April 16th, Cleo called the Ypsilanti Police Department and reported her daughter missing. At 6.35 a.m. on the morning of Wednesday, April 16th, just over 12 hours after Dawn had left her home, a man driving north on Gale Road spotted a body on the side of the road. He stopped at the next house he passed to call the police, and then he traveled on to work. The man who lived at the house walked down to the road to wait for police to arrive. The body was that of a young woman with strawberry blonde hair. A black electrical cord was tightened around her neck. Her body had been slashed. She wore only a bra and a blouse and was naked from the waist down. It appeared that she had been raped. As police studied the scene, they concluded the girl had been murdered elsewhere and dumped at the roadside. It was likely that she had been dumped within the previous couple of hours, otherwise a motorist would have noticed her. Police fanned out searching for evidence. A sheriff's deputy found a girl's shoe not far from the body along a chain-link fence that surrounded a golf course. An hour later, the matching shoe was found on the east side of Gale Road. It appeared that one shoe had been tossed from a moving vehicle as the killer drove the body to the dumping site, and the other shoe had been thrown out as the killer drove away. The sheriff's lieutenant, who Cleo Basum had called the night before, and whose own daughter was a close friend of Dawn's, identified the girl's body as that of Dawn Basum. Police found no evidence of Dawn's orange sweater or her pants at the scene. The proximity of Dawn's body to the road also made it very likely that she was dumped not long before she was found. 
The Ann Arbor Sheriff directed deputies to start looking for remote locations near Gale Road, where the murder might have been committed. Shortly before 11 a.m., a sheriff's deputy stopped at a deserted farmhouse just north of Ypsilanti. As he sifted through debris surrounding the house, he discovered a girl's orange mohair sweater, which matched the description of the sweater Dawn had been wearing the night before. The farm, long since abandoned, was located on LaForge Road near Gettys and just one mile north of Dawn Basom's home. The deputy called it in and more police arrived to search the property, which consisted of an old farmhouse structure which had largely collapsed, a partially destroyed barn, an old garage, and a water tower. The area was littered with garbage, broken liquor bottles, used condoms, and other debris. In the dismal basement, detectives found part of a girl's white blouse. They also saw streaks of fresh blood on the floor. Broken glass littered the basement stairs, and the pieces matched broken glass found embedded in Dawn's shoes. In the barn, an investigator found a piece of black electrical cord which matched the cord used to strangle the 13-year-old. It quickly became apparent to the police that the farm property was the place Dawn had been murdered. And furthermore, it might have been the site of other murders. Ann Arbor Sheriff, Sheriff Harvey, came up with a plan. Because the property had likely been the spot for multiple murders, the killer might return. He wanted to put a tight lid on the location and set up surveillance in hopes of nabbing the murderer if he returned to the scene. Unfortunately, his plan was almost immediately thwarted when word got out that the media had already published the farm's location. And this is something that came up often in my research for the Michigan murders. There were multiple times, and I'll refer to some further in the podcast, but there were multiple times when the police hoped to hide the location of a a murder scene to try to catch the killer, but there was such hysteria surrounding the murders that the media would almost immediately release a story when a body was found. Despite the inability for police to trap the killer at the farmhouse, it is believed that he returned. Several days after the space had been scoured by investigators, a deputy found a woman's earring and a piece of white blouse. Police believed these items were likely left by the killer after investigators had already left the scene. One month after the murder, the barn on the farmhouse property was burned to the ground. At first, police wondered if the murderer might have torched the barn to destroy evidence. However, it soon came out that a young man had gotten into a drunken fight with his girlfriend in the barn and decided, with the help of a friend, to light it on fire. They were cleared as having anything to do with the murders. One oddity discovered at the farm the day it burned were five fresh lilacs sitting in the driveway. Five lilacs, possibly for the five victims. No one ever came forward to say they'd left the flowers. On June 9, 1969, another body was found. Around 3.15 p.m. on that Monday afternoon, three teenage boys driving in a pickup truck turned onto an abandoned farm off of North Territorial Road in Northfield Township, approximately three miles away from Ann Arbor. One of the boys shrieked, Stop! Through the windshield, the boys were stunned to see a young woman's mostly naked body laying in the weedy driveway. Lieutenant Mulholland was the first at the scene, followed by Sheriff Harvey. Like the other victims, the girl's body had been dumped at a deserted farm. The skeletal remains of a house and two barns stood on the property. The young woman had been shot in the head, her throat had been cut, and she was stabbed. Her white skirt was blood spattered. Her raincoat was draped across her legs, and not far from her body lay a purple woman's pump. 
Heavy rain the night before had washed away additional evidence police might have found at the scene. Investigators did not find any purse or identification with the body, nor were there any missing persons report that matched her description. The only identifying item was the victim's raincoat, an interior tag in the distinctive red and black striped raincoat read Rubies. Investigators discovered that Rubies was a store located in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Evidence at the scene, or lack thereof, implied that the girl had been killed elsewhere. Dr. Robert Hendricks performed the autopsy. The victim weighed between 135 and 40 pounds. She was around 5 feet 7 inches tall and had dark brown hair pulled into a ponytail. Her cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head just above her hairline, which was fired at point-blank range from a 22 caliber gun. Damage to her right thumb indicated she'd put a hand up to protect herself from the shot. The stab wounds and cutting of her throat likely occurred after death. She'd also been sexually assaulted. Hendricks estimated she died sometime between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m., on the previous Saturday night. Police were mystified as to the woman's identity. They scoured missing persons report across the state but came up empty. In an attempt to discover who the girl was, police took photos of the uninjured side of her face and published them in area newspapers, asking anyone who recognized her to come forward. As they'd done in the previous cases, police began searching for the scene of the murder. On Tuesday evening, a deputy driving north on Earhart Road noticed something strange left on an isolated service road. When he pulled over for a closer look, he found a pair of women's brown loafers sitting in the road side by side. He got out, and as he looked around the shoes, he found two red buttons. Then he noticed dark brown stains splattered in the dirt. They looked like blood. More police soon arrived at the scene. They discovered the brown loafers fit the dead woman's feet, and the red buttons matched her raincoat. The dark stains were in fact blood. That same evening, a young man and woman walked into the sheriff's department. They'd seen the picture of the dead woman in the newspaper and the girl feared that it was her roommate, Alice Kalam. The girl explained that both she and Alice were recent graduates of the University of Michigan School of Architectural Design. They shared an apartment in a private house just off of the U of M campus. The roommate had last seen Alice the week before when she was heading home for a long weekend with family. The roommate had last seen Alice the week before when she was heading home for a long weekend with her family. Alice was going to be staying in town. Alice was from Portage, which was near Kalamazoo. This piqued the interest of law enforcement since they knew the dead girl's rain jacket had been purchased in Kalamazoo. Alice's roommate said when she returned from her weekend with family that Saturday night, she found their flat empty. The lights were on, and the only strange thing she noticed was a shoebox lying open on the living room floor. The man who'd accompanied Alice's roommate to the sheriff's office explained that he'd seen Alice the previous Friday. He'd loaned her his enlarger. When he left her apartment, she was developing prints in a closet dark room. She mentioned that she was excited for a party she was attending the following night, which would have been Saturday. He tried to get in touch with Alice over the weekend, but had no luck. He stopped by her apartment and was surprised to discover her prints still sitting in the hypo rinse, since Alice would have known to take them out before they were overdeveloped. Alice's roommate and the male friend viewed the body. They thought that it was her, but neither was positive. Police contacted Alice's supervisor at the library she worked at at U of M. He confirmed that the dead girl was Alice Kalam. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the state, Alice's parents would learn of her death in a most dreadful way. 
Dorothy Kalam, Alice's mother, was flipping through the newspaper when she came across the photograph of the dead girl recently found in Ann Arbor. She gasped and her husband, Joseph, walked over to see what was the matter. He too was subjected to the horror of seeing his daughter's face in the newspaper. The Kalams immediately climbed into their car and started the 100-mile drive to Ann Arbor. Alice Elizabeth Kalam was born on Christmas Day, December 25th in 1947 to parents Dorothy and Joseph in Elkhart County, Indiana. Joseph was a pharmacist. Alice had graduated the previous spring from the University of Michigan, but had stayed in Ann Arbor to take a summer course in order to earn a temporary teaching certificate. Alice's parents had been concerned about the Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor murders, but Alice insisted that she was safe. At the Ann Arbor Hospital, Joseph and Dorothy were escorted to the morgue where they stared in silence at the dead body of their daughter, whose short life had been violently stolen. Devastated, Joseph Kalam yelled out, No! No, I did not come here to see my daughter dead. I worked too damn hard to raise her, to send her to this. I don't want her dead body. I want her alive. His wife comforted him as he wept. Investigators started piecing together Alice's last day alive. The previous Saturday, June 7th, Alice had spent the day at a girlfriend's house, ironing clothes and chatting. Alice was excited for a birthday party she was attending that evening. The birthday was for a local Ann Arbor musician and was being held at the Depot House, a rehearsal house for rock bands. Around 8.30 that evening, a couple who lived in the apartment building where Alice resided saw her walking into the space with clothes draped over her arm. Alice left her apartment later that evening, dressed in a purple blouse, a white miniskirt, pantyhose, and brown loafers. She'd worn her contact lenses in lieu of her glasses. Alice also took a pair of new purple pumps she'd bought earlier that day at Jacobson's department store. She didn't want to get them wet, so she carried the shoes rather than wearing them to the party. Alice was also wearing her distinctive red and black striped raincoat from Ruby's. Alice's whereabouts after she left her apartment get hazy. Some witnesses claimed to see her dancing at the depot house until after midnight, including a person who thought he saw her leaving the depot house on a motorcycle. Other people claimed someone who looked very similar to Alice was there, but that Alice was not. Again, much to the frustration of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti police, there was little evidence about what had become of Alice after she left the party. In July, the case of the Ypsilanti Ann Arbor co-ed murders took another strange turn. Peter Herkos, a world-renowned Dutch porn psychic, flew into Michigan on July 21st to work on the unsolved murders. Herkos was known for working on the Boston Strangler case. However, he'd fallen out of favor with the public after lackluster results regarding the Boston homicides. His arrival was received with mixed emotions by Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti law enforcement. Ann Arbor Sheriff Douglas Harvey met the news with open disdain for the psychic. The Ann Arbor Chief of Police, on the other hand, Chief Krasny, showed a willingness to consider the man's ideas, figuring what did they have to lose. In a meeting that occurred with Herkos in California prior to his arrival in Michigan, the psychic created what he called a telepathic composite of the killer. He described the offender as a young man, under 25, not big, maybe 5 foot 6, 5 foot 7 inches tall, and around 140 pounds. He had light colored hair, sometimes wore a mustache, and may have dressed in women's clothing. He was very mixed up about sex, loved dolls and teddy bears, was brilliant, possibly a student. He worked during the day had a salesman job, perhaps, and lived in an apartment. He was good with his hands and machines, loved cars, and drove a motorcycle. His name was Rick, or Rich. He was strong, left-handed, 
had curly hair, a beautiful face, but strange eyes. He occasionally used marijuana. He wore a dark leather jacket and drove an old car. He killed the women in one place and then moved them elsewhere. He derived sexual pleasure from killing the women, and there would be another murder victim, possibly a colored woman. Herkos did little to move the investigation forward. However, Edward Keyes reported in his book, The Michigan Murders, that Peter Herkos did have an uncanny ability to know things he couldn't possibly have known, including telling an officer that he had a gas leak in his camper. When the officer called his wife, there was, in fact, a leak. Additionally, he described locations where victims had been found, as well as how their bodies were displayed when they were discovered, with an accuracy that confounded investigators. Four days after Herkos arrived in Michigan, the murder that would finally blow the case wide open occurred. That brings us to the conclusion of the first half of the Michigan murders case. The second half is in episode number three. You can go ahead and tune in for that right now. If you have any comments or case suggestions, please send me an email at bitterendingspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find out all of the resources for this episode and read the show notes and more.